This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 336 of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast, and this is our podcast year in review. I mean, it is the last podcast episode of the year right before uh, New Year's. And of course, as everyone does through all the media podcasts and everything else, we are going to recount the favorite, your favorite episodes, the episodes that you listened to the most. No voting in this one. Uh, we get to look at the raw download numbers and see exactly what you loved listening to the most. And we're going to go count down through that. And when I say we... In order to make this episode fun, and because I always come to, to Florida for the holidays every year to because uh, my family is here, uh, I figured it'd be more fun if I brought on a co-host for this episode. And so co-hosting this with me is uh, Chris Johnson of Green Bench. Welcome back to the podcast, Chris. Hey, Jamie. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to uh, look into your the raw data of, uh, of the year for you. It's crazy. We made it through 2023 already. Um, so I'm excited to look back with you. This year was tough. There's some challenges. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. But for the for the podcast, it's been an interesting one. We uh, we certainly you know found some uh, some new audiences, people listening to the podcast, uh, some of the uh, largest darn download numbers that we've ever seen. And uh, over the course of this past year, we saw about two million downloads of wow. this crazy little beer podcast. We now consistently chart in the like fifty range of Apple podcast food podcasts in the United States. That's impressive. There's because there's a lot now, so that's uh, that's that's incredible. It is mind blowing to see us like we're next to like Jose Andres, wow, you know, in yeah. a food podcast or the the Frontier Woman on that same. Like, <laughs> like that's a strange. Anyway, um, kind of kind of fun to see that, and I'm glad that uh, you you know those things soothe the ego. But what it means more than anything is that people care to listen and they care to keep coming back and listening again. And that means that hopefully we're producing, you know, content out there, sharing conversations, sharing insight from brewers that other brewers really care about. Because this is a niche. We talk about brewing. We can lose some people really quickly on this podcast. I am very aware of that. Well, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about Chris's year and uh, what's gone on the Green Bench. Obviously, I need an excuse to come back here because uh, it's been a few years. It's yeah, man. Like, I can't. It was either 2018 or 2019. It was 2019. We'll have to look back at the podcast and see. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> um, but also, you're a podcast listener, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, you've texted me through this year about uh, some of the episodes that stuck out with you. And uh, and so, as I was thinking about how we put this episode, together, I'm like, you know, I bet Chris would be good for uh, for some conversation about that. So here we are. We're going to go through it. Um, before we do that, for years, g and Chillers has chilled the beers you love, partnering with 3,000-plus breweries across the country. They're proud of the cool partnerships they've built over the past 30 years. They know brewing doesn't stop at 5 o'clock, and nor do they. g and uses quality components, expert craftsmanship, and constant innovation. With 24-7 service and support, your brewery will never stop. Remote monitor your chiller for simple and fast access to all the information you need providing you with the peace of mind your operation is running smoothly. Reach out for a quote today at gdchillers.com or call to discuss your next project. Also, support for this episode comes from BSG, looking for a sustainable way to increase fermenter capacity. Try FirmCap Eco from Cary, developed as a part of Cary's Eco Brewing range. FirmCap Eco is a plant-based alternative to traditional silicone-based products. FirmCap Eco increases fermenter capacity by reducing foam height to improve beer foam stability and enhance hop utilization. Visit bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact your BSG sales rep to get started. And if you hear Old Orchard mentioned in the brewing community, don't be surprised. The flavored craft juice concentrate blends from Old Orchard have shipped to over 46 states. Their new brewing customers often mention discovering Old Orchard through word-of-mouth recommendation of another brewer. To join the core of Old Orchard's brewing community, learn more at oldorchard.com slash brewer. Uh, before we get started, if you are a brewery and planning, um, if you are thinking about op- uh, owning a brewery, starting a brewery, acquiring a brewery, um, you know, in any kind of way, check out our brewery workshop. Uh, it's in March in Austin, Texas. We're taking the taking the show on the road to Austin. The website is breweryworkshop.com. 
Uh, we've got a whole bunch of breweries that have come through this program over the last uh, you know seven or eight years since we've been doing it. Probably I don't know, probably eighty or a hundred breweries operating now that have come through that program, and uh, uh, overwhelmingly, folks that have, have attended have said uh, that it is a valuable experience worth much more than the resources they put into it. And so, so if that is, describes you, go to breweryworkshop.com, check that out. And then the other milestone that we've hit here at Craft Beer and Brewing is as of last weekend, ten years. 10 years uh, from the, our very first full day of business in our, in our old office. Chris, 10 years. Yeah, that's, that's so impressive. It's awesome. Um, we're, we're both celebrating 10 years this year. We turned uh, 10 in the fall this year. So um, it's crazy to feel like, you know, we've, we've all sort of been on this ride for a decade and uh, doing something that we were passionate about, trying to contribute to something that we loved. Um, and then still being here excited about continuing that is, you know, there's not much more you could ask for, you know, the people around us that, that help us get here is, is what ultimately we think about and, and what matters to us. So, um, how we can give back to our employees and our community and, um, and the fact that just the being grateful, right. And just, just looking back on that and it's ups and downs throughout 10 years, but most of it is so worth it. Yes, always some ups and downs, and I think that's that's the case with every business, right? You know, you you start with business, you have a great idea, you think it's going to work, but you don't know it's going to work, and you really don't know it's going to work for at least five or six years. And I think as you know, that was our case. Like, uh, you know, we gave it a good go, and we thought we were going to make it, and there were some moments where, you know. We really weren't sure. I mean, obviously, we launched a you know print magazine in, in 2013, 2014. Who does that, Chris? Yeah, no, that didn't. That didn't. I think on on paper, it doesn't sound like you know a good idea. Uh, literally, in on paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but man, you guys have persevered. You've made it. I think you guys have become. Uh, a true staple in the industry, you know, from from day one to even now. I mean, almost everyone that I know is a subscriber uh, to your magazine. I'm talking about other brewers. Um, and so, you know, we see these magazines showing up on our doorstep, you know, every quarter. Um, and we all get excited about it. We all like to look through it. We all read the articles. We pass the magazine around, uh, you know, from the tasting room to the back of house to sales to, you know, all of our management team. We're all aware of what you guys are doing, and um, it's uh, it's beneficial to keep us all connected. And I think we all feel a little more connected uh, when you guys put out magazines. I appreciate that, man. You know, I think it's all that all any of us want to do in this world, right? Make a difference, you know, make an impact on people, make people's lives better. Um, you know, and you do that through your brewing and the beer that you all make here and the experiences that you share with people and the places you create. And, uh, you know, we try to do that by connecting brewers and, spot, you know, spotlighting those particular brewers that are doing remarkable work, adding to the overall community. And I think that's the coolest thing about what I get to do, what we get to do here. Um, you know, talk to amazing brewers and share their viewpoints on how they do things in a way that uh, other folks in the industry can learn from, share from, be inspired by. Uh, and it's a real testament to the entire community of craft beer. You know, obviously we couldn't do it if it were just us. Uh, it takes people being a part of this and sharing with us and trusting us. Um, and it's something that we care deeply about and we've worked really hard on to build. And so thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Congratulations. How was, uh, how was your year? Uh, our year it's, it's, it is crazy to think it's almost over. And to your point earlier, you know, there's with, with the end of it, there is also the beginning of something new. Um, and so it's definitely a time of reflection. You know, we're spending a lot of the last couple months at the end of Q4 here, um, really looking back on the year. Literally when you walked up, I was talking to our sales director about looking ahead and, and some stuff and some things we're going to, you know, try in the market and, um, and just looking at production trying to assess what we've been through. Uh, we've had growth, which is, you know, wonderful, especially in a time where um, I think most industries are, are kind of down or stagnant or, you know, you're happy if you're stagnant at the very least right. uh, these days. Uh, it seems like almost any industry, you know, we're not, it's not just beer. And I think other ones aren't as, aren't uh, immune to, you know, the, the changes in the economy and the market and uh, and and habits uh, of consumers um, and what's important to people and so trying to maintain relevancy um, trying to stay excited um, which isn't you know always difficult for me um, I think I'm fortunate enough to be a fairly passionate person um, but I do think that you know some of the challenges that we've gone through I think have made us a stronger company and a stronger unit of people um, and a stronger community. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about St. Petersburg specifically. I, I think about this town a lot. You know, this is where we decided to, to make our home and, and put our brewery. 
And uh, the growth around us in the last 10 years is insane. I mean, there was none of these buildings were really here 10 years ago. And uh, everything around us has grown up so much that uh, we feel like we're a part of that growth. So it's hard to not feel connected to something. And um, I think when we Whenever we do something, we have that in mind. And I think over the over this this last year, that's what we're most proud of is is connecting more and more deeper uh, relationships with our community, which has been something we've tried to do from day one. So um, it's been a it's been a good year overall. Challenges for sure, but uh, man, we're optimistic about next year, and we're we're finishing strong. It's the the inherent human trait, right? Like uh, you can say a lot of things about humanity, um, but we humanity tends to be optimistic. I think that, uh, you know, we have a, you know, default mode that, uh, you know, for self-preservation and also, um, you know, that is just built around this idea that tomorrow can be better to, than today. And then I think that's a, you know, kind of one of those core tenets of, of craft beer too, that even if it's challenging, we can still make tomorrow a little bit better than today. Um, you know, in that sense, are there any, uh, you know, broader trends or some things that really stick out in your yeah, mind? Yeah, you want the Just, highlights, right? Yeah. You want the, yeah. It's your highlight reel. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to go a little chronologically because that'll, that'll sure. help me sure. keep it in line. I think earlier this year I got, you know, real excited again, uh, hitting cider Con, um, at the beginning of last year or this year rather. And, you know, got me excited about cider again. I know you guys have a cider issue now and, and, um, you know, that was exciting. We were already, you know, I mean, I think all of us are totally stoked on Beth Demon's book about, oh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, cider for or craft beer lovers, you know, and she's so awesome. Right. Uh, chatting with her, having ciders with her has been really cool over the last couple of years, you know, getting to cider con again, getting jazzed about the juice that was coming out in different places and, and getting excited again, really, you know, you'd, I would say at the beginning of the year, we were Definitely still in a little bit of a, you know, post um, pandemic sort of shutdown you know, lethargy, if you will, and, sure, and trying to get sure. back into being excited about being around a group of people, <laughs> you know. Um, and so uh, that was super exciting. Uh, so cider is a big thing on our on our in our, in our focus, uh, that we've having a lot of fun with. We just got our juice in actually last month from upstate New York. So I'm kind of thinking a lot about cider these days and a lot of our blends and ferments. Um, Soon after that was the bus beer collaboration that I did with uh, a group of the uh, uh, some of the people that we went to the Czech Republic with um, the year prior, which was uh, an exceptional um, opportunity for all of us. Uh, we learned a lot about, I think, ourselves, about beer and, and about uh, some other people and their passions. And um, man, that was so much fun making that beer and having them here. And, and you know, it had been almost a year since we had all been together again. And uh, man, that was special. And then to follow that up with the release in Nashville at CBC was so much fun. Um, we're actually planning on sort of bus beer 2.0 coming up next month or in two months. So they're all coming back in February. So that'll be super fun. Um, nice. That was a great beer. That was the beer that Peter Kylie and I, uh, for Monday night were drinking while we recorded that podcast at, uh, at CBC. Yeah. I love that picture I see in the, in the <laughs> advertisements, you guys are chatting and Peter's all, you know, animated with his hands up and you guys got bus beers on the table. That's super fun. Yeah. That yeah. beer was fun. Uh, there's that. And then the, the NBA- I went a year after you to the Czech Republic, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I agree with you. Like, Life changing. It's just, just it's exceptional. A, yeah, yeah. It definitely changed not just our, tra- I wouldn't say our trajectory, but it definitely brought into focus something that I think we were interested in and passionate about without really having a ton of understanding. Um, and that's kind of how I always felt about Czech beer. It's, you know, it's not that I disliked it, quote unquote. It was that I didn't know if I was actually drinking Czech beer or not until I went to the Czech Republic and I, and I got to understand what it really meant, not just the beer, but to the people that were making right. it and consuming it. Um, and that, was that's a that's a beautiful beautiful um, uh, it's it's a beautiful place to drink beer and it's it's like a wonderful sort of industry in of itself you know uh, that you find there and looking at that beer as a social technology and not just you know a vice it, I think is was fascinating mm-hmm. you see that uh, you know the the beer you know even the way that the beers are designed you know for drinkability at low alcohol strength. Um, really primarily meant to be conser- you know consumed on premise mm-hmm. with other people you know, in a public kind of setting you know the the recipe fits the the cultural drinking mode fits the you know and you know it and it creates this this way to you know ease conversations and bring people together and lower uh, uh, barriers between people and you know the whole idea of that and thinking about beer in those terms and not just a hey let's get drunk you know yeah no doubt I, I think that that was another important viewpoint you know yeah. that, uh, that, that this is what we do here in the beer industry is not just 
uh, you know, about uh, pure unbridled pleasure and excess. It is very much built around, um, you know, thinking about beer as this kind of technology. Anyway, uh, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, you used the right word. That was the word I was actually kind of searching for there for a second. But it is, it is uh, by definition, I think, one of the most cultural experiences that you can have with beer because the beer is so tied to culture there um, in a way that I don't think it is in a lot of places, or at the very least, not in the same way. You have to look at it differently in some of the other cultures. And um, so that was fun and wonderful. Yeah. And so being able to share that again with the guys that I went there with and learned that with, um, uh, we also, you know, had our first board meeting and launched the National Black Brewers Association of America. That's a huge highlight for me. I'm one of the board members of that. Um, that started at CBC, and we've been going strong. It's we're promoting um, black ownership and black brewmasters in the industry itself. Just trying to continue to diversify the industry. Some of our work with Beer Culture, another nonprofit that I'm a part of, and then the MJF, the Michael James Jackson Foundation for Brewing and Distilling. We're doing great work there. I'm on the board of all those. So trying to make sure that we're, we're constantly focused on, on, uh, meeting this industry's changes and demands, um, with quality and, uh, you know, integral diverse, um, candidates. And so that's, that's something that's been, you know, a big focus of mine this last year. Um, I went to Mexico city again in the summer. That was awesome. I got to see my buddy, Josh Bringle, head brewer of, uh, Hercules. Of Hercules. Yeah. So I uh, hung out with him and his family and, and they have a lager bar in Mexico City, literally called Lager Bar. And so I hung out with him there and we drank a ton of his lager. Um, talking about lager with him all year, he came and just brewed a beer with us, an export lager that's on right now. I'm super proud of. Um, we'll have some of those later. And uh, yeah, so just focusing on, you know, the things that make us excited, um, you know, getting back into making more Saison and blend and uh, mixed culture beers, you know, things that, you know, from day one have made me excited, being able to continue to share those and share, you know, my experiences and learning about other people's cultures and learning about how they produce things and why, and then being able to bring that to a city and a town that I'm super proud of and, and excited to share with, um, that's, that's been it, man. You know, our, our mission statement literally in our, it always said, you know, brew quality, beer, build community. And that was always my, my thought. I wanted to make the best thing I could, um, in the place, you know, that, and, and build something special in a place that I cared about. And so bringing these awesome cultures, bringing this experience, bringing these amazing products and, and fun ideas, uh, to St. Pete, Florida has been the, the most exciting part. Well, I think we'll touch a little bit. I've got some questions for you that I'll leave till the end of this, uh, you know, just to, to give you some time to think about it. And it's probably time for us to start uh, to, count, to counting down our top 10 episodes of the podcast for this past year. Before we do that, ProBrew is excited to announce they are currently featuring short lead times between two and four weeks for their in-stock ProFill rotary can fillers. These can fillers run at speeds between 100 and 600 plus cans per minute while achieving precise and consistent filling volumes not achievable by most inline and mobile fillers. For more information, fill out their contact form on www.probrew.com or email contact us at probrew.com to learn exactly how they can take your operations to the next level. ProBrew, brew your beer. Also, oh, you like wildly aromatic IPAs and tropical lagers? Good thing Omega designed thylized yeast. For just that reason, thylized yeast are a new tool for brewers to bring intense guava and passion fruit aromas out of your malt and hops. And wait, there's more. Omega Yeast makes yeast to order with a consistent one-week lead time, ensuring peak freshness and reliability. And everyone's talking about the 2024 California Craft Beer Summit, March 12th through 14th in Sacramento. With their speaker announcements, it's easy to see why. Kicking off the summit as a keynote speaker is Rob Todd, the pioneer who built Allagash Brewing. Alongside him in the opening session is Christopher Shepard from Beer Marketers Insights with the latest industry insights in craft beer. Check out the full schedule at the website, CACraftBeerSummit.com. All right, Chris, we're going to start off our uh, top 10 list. Uh, and uh, like I said, I went back through uh, a week or two ago, compiled our top 10 list based on the most downloaded episodes this year. And I, I should say one of them is from December of last year, where it was too new to make the, the list last year when we did this countdown. And so we'll basically kind of look at it from like, you know, December 1st to yeah, December. Like so, yeah. within an, a year-ish. 
Right. It's almost like our, our best in beer window is GABF to GABF, right? Like, you know, that's our, our business of beer year, uh, you know, for, for beer industry purposes. So for this one, you know, right, roughly, roughly uh, early December or so. And our number 10 spot uh, this year, uh, episode number 317, that is Avery Swanson from Keeping Together. And this one, uh, we had a really interesting conversation. We drove down to Santa Fe, uh, met up with them there. I love Santa Fe. And then that episode talks about how much I love Santa oh, Fe. Oh, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were drooling over Santa Fe, which was awesome. Um, and I, I've never had the pleasure of, of uh, visiting Santa Fe yet, um, but I'm very excited about um, what Avery's doing. And, and, uh, and she's got a property now, and I know she's uh, in the weeds a little bit. Um, this this episode was awesome. Obviously, always catching up with her is great. I got to see her for the first time in a while at Snallygaster earlier this year, which was really cool. And um, just catch up with her a little bit um, since she finally feels like she's setting down and, and building, you know, digging some roots. And it's exciting. A fellow Saison lover and brewer. Well, let's hear our uh, a quick excerpt from this episode, our 10th most downloaded of the year. I've had a number of conversations with colleagues as well about the term farmhouse ale and kind of using that. And I know that it is used pretty interchangeably with Saison at this point, and I don't disagree with that. But I do think that for the average consumer to say farm, like what does farmhouse ale mean? Like it has a fairly esoteric or perhaps not esoteric, but like experiential connotation to it as well. Like when you think of farmhouse, what do you think? I think for me, I generally expect it to have some sort of texture or rusticity to it. I want it to have, uh, you know, it might have a little bit of funk, but it doesn't have to. It might have a little bit of acidity, but it doesn't have to. Um, I don't know. I feel the same way about Saison, but Saison, like I said earlier, has that more kind of esoteric term that people don't fully understand. And I think a lot of people aren't willing or are not as eager to get into that vulnerable place of well, what is that? What does that taste like? So, I don't know. I There's guess probably something when I think about farmhouse that uh, you know I don't want to use the word term barnyard because I think that's a dumb and overused term. Yeah. But uh, you know, I think there is some sort of like grassy or hay or you know grain, uh, some sort of component there that feels agricultural. And I, and right. That, that you know, and there there's probably a you know, a toothiness to it that, that probably that feeds into it so that it feels substantial and not necessarily as, uh, you know, as purely refined. Um, you know, and those are things that I'd want to seek out if I heard, you know, some, hear the word farmhouse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, that's something that I was thinking about just within the last couple of days, you know, since I can't make any beer, I'm over here reading about reading craft beer and brewing articles about Saison, actually. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> um, and there are some really great articles on the website about Saison. Um, and we're just kind of thinking about rusticity and what it, what it has meant to me as a beer maker throughout my career. And, you know, in, in Texas at, at JK, we were, I feel like a, a fair amount of the kind of rustic elements of that beer were coming primarily from the water, honestly. I mean, of course, we were using craft malt as often as we could, had good relationships there and access to to good craft malt. Um, but we used plenty of mass-produced malt, and there's nothing wrong with that by you know at all. But when you're looking to create an experience of rusticity, you know, you need to start with your raw materials. And I think that the water profile that we had there was the perfect starting place for that. The perfect, imperfect starting totally, place. Totally. For that. Like I remember when I first got started there, we were at the tail end of like a, a very long term drought in in the hill country. And, you know, we were working on really sophisticated equipment and had to boil all of our water before we transferred it to the hot liquor tank. <laughs> so not sophisticated at all. Um, but we were literally, we would fill our 60 barrel kettle full of well water and we would boil it for an hour in order to try to precipitate out some of the alkalinity and that like hardness um, before transferring it to the jacketed hot liquor tank so that it would stay warm <laughs> for the next day when we came in at 5.30 or 6 or whatever to brew. Um, and I remember when I first got started there, the water was so hard. Uh, I would do that and there would just be a pile of like sludge 
chalk in the bottom of the kettle um, and I'd go to open the dump yeah. valve on the kettle to get rid of it and clean it out and it would just be like a puff of white smoke from the chalk. It was so, so yes, imperfectly perfect um, for the profile that we wanted for the beers. Um, but I remember when I first got started in Chicago, the water there is completely different. You know, it's like Great Lakes, pure um Lake Michigan, pure water. And I was like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? I've never had to deal with water <laughs> chemistry before. I understand it in theory, but How do like, I junk this up honestly, and make it more farmhouse? Where is yeah. the calcium sulfate? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, you know, I eventually managed to kind of get it around where I wanted it to be, but it wasn't an element that I was relying on at that point to create that textural or that like rustic element in the beers. Always thoughtful stuff from Avery right there. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to see what else uh, she pulls as they have a firm home for, for keeping together as a brand and the experience that she builds at the, at the brewery, new brewery that she's putting together in Santa Fe. Chris, next up, uh, number nine, episode 305 of the podcast. This is one, uh, after you were listening to it, you shot me a text about mm-hmm. it. I've listened to it a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> Well, why don't you introduce it? Uh, you know well. Well, this one was very exciting. Uh, having sixth generation, you know, owner and uh, brewmaster Matthias Trum from Schlinkerla, um, obviously a, a legend to to most of us brewers and and those of us uh, smoke aficionados that that love the the Bamberg style smoked beers. Uh, like you said, I I remember listening to this one that morning. I was on my run. I think I wasn't even done with my run yet, and I texted you. And I was like, it's probably early, you know, over in Colorado. But I'm just gonna go ahead and message Jamie about how exciting that was to kind of hear um, you guys' conversation. He, I could hear, I could listen to him kind of forever, which I think is what I said to you. Um, it was 45 just, minutes on history, and I don't want him to stop. I think that was what you texted me. It, it was, was great. So yeah. good, man. And it was, you know, it was, it, it, it brought a, it brought into focus something that I think we've all, for some reason that style seems mysterious, you know, and, and I think, um, kind of letting us peek behind the curtain is what it felt like when he was, when he was talking about, um, the history of the, of the space. And, and I know that was what his, I think his master's dissertation at, at, uh, when Stefan was, was on the history of brewing. So, um, wonderful, wonderful, uh, history lesson about Bamberg and about beer in general, and specifically about Schlinkerla, uh, to the point where, you know, like I'd always heard that, the Hellas was made with, you know, using yeast from, you know, smoked beer and everything. And and as a big time smoke fan, smoked beer fan, you know, I've, whenever I have beers and even the ones I've made that have a little bit of smoked malt, I kind of never didn't really like those too much. It almost, it almost hits my palate as, um, as an off flavor, like a, like a smoky kind of bandaid phenolic. So I'm always like, you know, smoke the beer or don't like hundred percent smoke malt or as much as you can possibly put in there or don't do it. Um, has been my, my motto, but I did, we rebrewed a collab we did with Ashley and Bill from Bierstadt called Spark. It's our, uh, smoked Mertzen that we brew with them. And so I harvested the yeast from that and just made a straight Hellas with, you know, just Pilsner malt and pitched that yeast. And sure enough, man, it, it has, it has that subtle smoke character, but it doesn't taste disjointed. It actually tastes really, it's on tap too. We'll try that later. It's called our Bamberg style Hellas. And it's really based off of that conversation. I listened to that. I was like, oh, I got to make it now. So that's awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's listen to a, a short clip of uh, Matthias talking about uh, smoked beer in Bamberg. The term Rauchbier, which is the German for smoke beer. Rauch means smoke, that guttural CH, Rauch, which is very hard to pronounce for a lot of people from, from England or with English uh, no, uh, language background. So Rauchbier, that term, first for the first time, you find the term Rauchbier in a document in 1899. Before that, it doesn't exist. And that document of 1899, again, Christian Fiedler found that. He's really amazing what he researched about Bamberg. That document of 1899 actually is a fictional travel report about Bamberg where somebody says, oh, Rauchbier, that's something you, knew, you only find here. So in 1800, everybody was making Rauchbier in Germany. And in 1900, suddenly, Bamberg is the only place where you can find it. And Thanks to this English technology, damn Thank, it. Yeah, so it's all the English faults, uh, of course. No, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's always like that. You know, you have new inventions and then maybe one or two people decide to stick with the old uh, technology for whatever reason. And 
That now is the real interesting question. Why did Schlenkeler continue to do it the old that way? That was my next question. What was it about Bomberg, Schlenkeler, Spezial that, that led them to continue doing it the old way? Um, there's a number of influence. Like, there's not one reason and there's not like a written document uh, that, that, that says it, but there's a number of influences. First of all, the breweries are very small. Um, Bamberg never had something called um, uh, uh, the, the Bannmeile. Mm. In old days, usually the cities were so powerful that they uh, were able to disallow brewing around the city limits, like in the villages around the city, so that the villagers around the city had to purchase beer from the local breweries in the city. That was... Um, a, a, they called it Bannmeile, like a protection mile sure, around the city. Sure. Bamberg never had that hmm. for whatever reason. So beer diversity always was higher here in Bamberg. Brewers were smaller. Uh, Bamberg was never, never had any big export brewery like uh, Kulmbach, for instance, or the, the big industry breweries you know these days, like the Spaten in Munich. So Bamberg was all very local about beer making. And um, the, the problem with smoke mold making is you have to do it manually. You cannot automate it. You cannot build big kilns. So you need small craft breweries to do that. And uh, all over the rest of Germany, these small craft breweries disappeared, vanished, most of them. And here in Bamberg, that structure remained relatively intact. A lot of them closed too. World War One, World War Two was horrible. But um, a lot of the breweries actually survived. So that was the one... Point. The second point was that uh, Bamberg had a relatively easy access to high quality wood for killing the malt. Mm. Um, to the west of Bamberg is the largest beechwood forest of Germany and beechwood is the most suitable wood or the most traditional standard wood which was used in the old times for killing the malt. Whereas the modern fuel which was used in other operations, coal, had to be transported by train over long mm. distance. So it was easier with that access. Um, the next step is, I think, the history where Bamberg came from. Um, I said originally that Bamberg was a king diocese, so uh, a Catholic town. And we know Catholics are very open for new developments, you know, like women's equality and stuff like that. That always happens a little bit later with the Catholics. And You're <clears> saying they're conservative about some things. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah. just a little bit. And um, so I, I think that conservatism, which often is depicted in a negative way, yeah, but... Con to conserve comes from from Latin conservare, mean, which means to preserve something, which uphold, which means to uphold something, to bring it into the next generation. And from that positive point of view, I think um, my brewing family, my my ancestor uh, Michael Graser, he was the important one in that respect. He was very much about keeping old traditions and and preserving it the old way. You've seen the Schlenkeler Tavern. Um, it's basically like a time travel when you come in here. You have all these old depictions on the wall. You have a Gothic ceiling um, in, in the Dominicana Klause, which used to be the chapel of the Dominican Monastery of Bamberg. You have the old tables, the old chairs. Um, uh, in, in, in Altes Lokal, the tables are something like 90 years old. And my great-grandfather, Michael Graser, um, when he inherited the place from the original Schlenkerler, from Andreas Graser, he was a very young, young guy, actually. And he wanted to go to university, into arts, into uh, the, the beautiful sciences. And now he was pushed into running the brewery here and he put his mark in the brewery. And I think he was the one who recognized, well, this is something special. This is something close to extinction. This is something we need to preserve. And he very deliberately made the choice of continuing the smoke malt operation. And I probably something similar happened over at Spezial. So, um, I mean, Michael Graza was the one who in the 1920s, when all the brewers here were, you know, craft people, but not very business oriented or, or uh, uh, yeah, modern in that respect. He registered Schlenkeler as a trademark. And Schlenkeler was the nickname of his uh, father. We can talk about that later on. Uh, so he was, I think he was the, the, uh, the, the, the real founding father of what Schlenkeler is today because he saw the potential. And at the same time, he felt obligated to preserve the old tradition. And he turned Schlenkeler into what it is today. And he made the decision, yes, we continue the smoke beer. He put out some of those ads where it says, hey, Bamberger Rauchbier, that's something special and that's only here. So 
with everything I do today, I try to honor what he has done in preserving this, this old tradition. Next up, our number eight spot. Um, this was one from December of last year. Another logger episode. Not a, not a shocker, although uh, I don't want to ruin things. But a lot of these logger episodes are in the bottom half of the top five. And, uh, you know, top, the top five, it, it, interesting to see how they cluster like that. Um, this one's episode 282 uh, with Euron and Sean from Halfway Crooks in Atlanta, um, where uh, they talk about their lager beer, their lager brewing uh, process, as, as well as their, their process around Belgian beers. Yeah, awesome beers, awesome guys, uh, wonderful spot in Atlanta. Um, Sean was one of the guys that was, with me on my uh, check trip. And so he's, you know, one of the guys that comes down in February and brews bus beer with us. So I love him to death. Um, he comes here and just cycles around St. Pete and then comes brews, brews some beer. Uh, this episode was awesome. Um, great insight. These guys have, what's, what I really like about Halfway is they care very much about traditional beers and process and they've sort of tried a bunch of stuff. So they always have a ton of information based upon their experiences that, you know, the facade is these beers that look beautiful, but what goes what, what's behind that is all of these steps and processes that they've tried, um, and they've really dialed in because they care, and I think that comes through really well. I think you're right. It is this deep respect for the history and tradition, but also uh, they're not afraid to use modern tools and what they have, and also you know ex- understanding the limitations of their own brew house. Uh, in order to achieve their ultimate flavor goals. And, you know, Dogma doesn't take any of these tools off the table. They will combine all of those and whatever whatever method makes the best beer for them. Such a cool one. Let's, uh, let's take a listen to a quick clip from that one. Yeah, we've, we found the hops that we get from, uh, from sourcing through uh, Florian to be pretty consistent aromatically. Um, you know, the, the bitterness does change, but the, the, the aroma profile uh, typically for us uh, stays... Year to year? Yeah, quite, quite the same. I mean, we usually don't have both of them right in front. You know, they're not, sure, it's not apples sure. to apples, but um, we, we, you know, for, we don't see any, any wide changes, yeah. or like big, big changes. Um, so like for, for, for instance, Hersbrucker, you know, we, I really like Hersbrucker uh, from sites. I, I get like kind of like a fennel quality from that, from that hop, which I, which I actually enjoy. Um, get a little bit of like lime, lime zesty kind of mm-hmm. poppiness from it. Um, we tend to use a lot of select here, Walter select, um, that I find to be very floral. I get this like kind of cracker like kind of thing from it which i really enjoy I, I don't really know how to describe that um it's 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 like a it's, say, i'd say they're all, all very like subtle hops that uh how would i say that they don't like stand out but they like they make the beer complete it's not like any aggressive standouts like i like i would say the blanc i think i always am impressed with how like nice it smells in a beer yeah, they. It's not. It's hard to say. It's hard. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, but they they make the beer whole. They make you make me complete. Yes. <laughs> you complete me. Uh, um, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious about this. Like, um, you know, if you're going to have a slew of different pills on there, there has to be some differentiating factors. But each of them also has to feel compelling and purposeful. You know, and not just we're just doing this to do this, you know, there's like, it wouldn't be worth the trouble if, if yeah. there wasn't a reason, like, and, you <laughs> yeah. know, right. They yeah. both have to be differentiated so that when people drink them, they can experience some of that difference and they know what those things are, you know, while at the same time you, you know, that should be, there should be a positive quality to that and not just a difference for the sake of difference. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm just, just curious. And then about- actually another thing that we need to add, to our loggers is we we have this hop back we actually bought it from john at little cottage but we started uh with hvg we started getting fresh backs so uh, whole cone hops Mm. and um basically at the end of the boil instead of uh doing we'll do like a light whirlpool yeah your full whirlpool will just run the wort over a hop back Mm -hmm. full of like i think it's what do we use 10 kilograms in total yeah. Of hops, whole cone that we have like broken up. On a 12 hectoliter batch. And, and, and the hops will sort of like filter the wort. So you'll get mm-hmm. clear wort, but also like the, the aromatics of that is, is, is amazing. 
Uh, and and I, that's also something that this year we, or next year, sorry, we'll, we'll do more often. We did like a whole colon uh, marathon this year for Oktoberfest, and uh, it was it was very very uh, yeah. it was well received. I, I really yeah, really yeah. enjoyed it. It didn't last very long. When you say break them up, you know, do you are you grinding them? Are you chopping them? Yeah, no, sorry, like, but the fresh pack they're oh, vacuum packed, right. so they're so very just, compact. So we need to like just, break them up. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they're all. You doing that in a low oxygen environment, or is it just atmosphere? No. Yeah. Atmosphere, yeah, it goes straight into the um, into the hot pack from the mm. from the kettle. Sort of a technique I, I saw at the Hlazen Toren in, in Belgium. They they do that to basically take the protein out of the the, the wort, yeah. clarify it instead of whirlpooling, and and yeah, I mean the beers we we've made so far are, are amazing. Yeah, we we've used a, a Mira in that. We've used this new hop from HVG. Uh, we've used Saphir. Um, I think those are the two main ones we yeah. use. I mean, we we do it with pretty much all of our Belgian pale ales now um, yeah. with Belgian uh, whole corn hops that we that we yeah. source, yeah. which we haven't even gotten into the, the Belgian hops yet. But uh, we're going to talk about uh, Belgian beers here in a second. <laughs> uh, we're going to we're going to let this one run yeah. um, and uh, and just keep talking because, I mean, hey, you know, we haven't even talked about our beer of the year yeah. sanguine yet. I <laughs> uh, can't let you get away without talking about that. But what you, from a sensory perspective, what is that, uh, you know, that whole cone hop back? Uh, you know, what does that add to some of these? Because obviously you have a frame of reference, and having not done it that way, uh, you know, what do you think sensorially that that adds? I think I think it adds that like classic German like floral character. It kind of intensifies that, but 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 also it it it, it gives you that kind of um, like especially with the Saphir, you get this like kind of uh, like tangerine kind of very beautiful citrus like subtle. All these all these com- all these things that we talk about, um, it, it almost sounds like we're talking about IPA. You know, like uh, th- these are all very subtle. Like yeah, you were saying, I mean, we're, we're taking yeah. hops back yeah. for lager. Come yeah. on, yeah. Come it, it, on. these are all I very subtle things fun. that happen, and yeah. yeah, they like what you weren't said. They all kind of uh, they're all parts that complete this like whole kind of picture, right? Um, this beer, no beers and, have a you know a lock on yeah. specific techniques, yeah. but I think that's also you know what you're saying. It's the the beautiful thing about this that. Uh, uh, all of these beers impact the way that other beers and styles are brewed. And, uh, you know, we're using all, as you say, all the tools in the toolbox here. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, whether that's... Uh, except a coction. Except a, well. <laughs> that's for you, Eric. We're going we're gonna to move into non-lager uh, in our number seven spot next. Before we do that, brewers, are you looking for the best beer, meat, and cider recipes on the planet? Join the American Homebrewers Association to unlock the 2023 National Homebrew Competition Medal Winning Recipes. American Homebrewers Association members have access to nearly 1,400 trusted and tested recipes, plus a Zymergy Magazine subscription, exclusive discounts, live webinars, instruction videos, and more. Plus, sign up for a membership by December 31st, 2023, and select a free brewing book, a $25 value. Learn more at homebrewersassociation.org slash cbbpod. Also, brewers need a competitive edge to stay ahead in this market, and Lotus is here to provide that edge with flexible financing solutions. Lotus Beverage Alliance is introducing financial tools tailored exclusively for the needs of brewers and other beverage makers. For the first time, you can utilize your equipment loan to not only purchase essential brewing equipment, but also ingredients, small parts, and other consumables. Reach out today to take your craft to the next level with Lotus Beverage Alliance. All right, episode number 314 is in the number seven spot. Um, This one was one that uh, also, you know, it's so funny how many of these panel discussions start with a text, right? (laughs) So uh, so I had done a, I I did the uh, uh, West Coast IPA Now podcast panel and I got a text from Joe Morfeld of of Pine House. And I was like, dude, this episode was great. Like, well, okay, you want to do one? And it's like, well, what do I do it on? Like, you tell me. It's like, what if we do one on Fresh Hops? Like, that makes a lot of sense. That's awesome. That would be great. Let's, you know, this was, you know, January or or February. And it was like, let's do that in like this summer and plan around it. And so we did. And this episode came together. It was our Fresh Hop panel with Joe Morfeld, Steve Luke, and Zach Turner. Sorry. Joe of Pine House, Steve from Cloudburst, Zach Turner of Single Hill. Um, and a, a fun way to look at the way those three brewers do different things with their approach to fresh hops. Absolutely. You know, 
being a brewery in Florida, it's uh, it is it is it's awesome to hear you know uh, people in on the Pacific Northwest specifically uh, with the access that they have to sort of hops and going out there every year for selection, being able to go to Single Hill, for example, in Yakima and trying their fresh hops every single year um, have and, and every year them sort of raising the bar a little bit, I feel like um, in what they learned from last year. I find fresh hops so fascinating because they, their window is so narrow, right? They don't have that much time to, they can't spend all year working on a fresh hop beer, but listening to this panel, they're, they're able to take experiences throughout their year um, and then apply it on those, on those subsequent batches that they're making. Um, and it's just, it's, it's inspiring. It's, you know, you get excited when you come home from hop selection uh, you get to taste all these cool fresh hot beers. Of course, like I said, in Florida, I can get some overnighted here, but it's it, it the romance isn't exactly the same. Um, so uh, it's fun to to hear about hear people so passionate about hops and and are, that are making such a, uh, incredible examples of fresh hot beers. Um, oh, I come home really jazzed every time I, I get to try their beers. Well, the industry you know has been paying attention to this excitement and and uh, you know buzz around fresh hop and are developing new products to help make that happen. Um, and it's such a cool thing to see all of this happening um anyway let's listen to a, a quick excerpt from uh, from episode 314 our, our fresh hop panel let's talk about 301 and uh, iqf and some of these other uh evolving you know products and steve why don't you just keep that conversation going because you started it i yeah sure we'll keep it going i mean i almost feel like that these products were invented for joe uh <laughs> And then, you know, we... I'm going to pour myself some of your, your <laughs> beer now, Joe, just, uh, you know, uh, just so, so I, I'm making sure I'm referencing these correctly. But yeah, I guess like, I guess to kind of take one, a half step back, you know, the last five years as as fresh wet hop beers has uh, become more and more popular and their kind of, their range has, you know, left the Northwest and, and have been brewed all over the country. You know, fairly quickly, hop uh, farms and brokers realized that it was really hard to ship wet hops, you know, overnight somewhere uh, via traditional methods. So um, there's been a lot of like fun, creative, some better than others, you know, development. It's like, how do we get wet hops to? Texas? How do we get wet hops to Georgia? You know, and, and like, how are they still okay enough to brew with, you know, when they kind of get there? So um, it's a kind of all roads lead to the freezer. And uh, yeah, the, the IQS little chain. Um, I mean, Zach, you probably, you probably heard uh, whispers before I did as far as, you know, like throwing fresh picked unkilned wet hops through an IQF freezing belts and then you know, a few years later, all of a sudden, those those frozen, wet whole cones were being pelletized into three hundred ones. So, yeah, the IQF hops isn't particularly new in terms of concept. It's it's been around a long time. And there's even like old old patents related to freezing hops instead of kilning them. Um, from I forget what the years of when I was looking at up some of this stuff while I was at YCH um, as an alternative to kilning. But uh, I think in the past. Some processors had tried to do IQF hops and they just didn't find a market or they didn't find enough anchor customers for it. So the, while it worked, um, they didn't end up turning into a product line. And that's kind of what YCH has at least reasonably successfully done now by like running hops through IQF line, which stands for individually quick frozen, which is the same process that blueberries run through or raspberries or strawberries that you go buy in your bag at Costco or something. Um, the line is identical. So they're just running hops through it and packaging them off. And that and that that works in Yakima because a lot of those a lot of other fruits that are IQF processed are also grown in Yakima. Sure. And so, as long as the timing works out, you can uh, use some of the same equipment without having to to, to buy new stuff. Joe, yeah, talk there's at least about, a few here. Yeah. <laughs> just a couple. You know, Joe, for you, uh, you know, using fresh hops and using wet hops, or now IQF. And 301 trial, which is basically a pelletized version of IQF hops. Uh, you it's know, a cryo. Do, is... It's a cryo process oh, version, actually. Cryo. Pro okay. <laughs> so the 301 is they're taking IQF hops, so they're already frozen, 
and they're running them through the cryo line. This is also YCH products. And so the cryo line shatters the cone, separates it, and then repelletizes it. So you couldn't pelletize it if it was just a frozen cone. Um, I think you can barely do it as the cryo because it's just so wet. The moisture content is 70% instead of 10 and uh, it kind of turns, melts into Play-Doh, the 301 does, um, even at that moisture content, you know. So, yeah, sorry to clarify there and interrupt, but. When it comes to using them, Joe, how, uh, you know, how has using these worked out for you, especially uh, grabbing them remotely and having them shipped down to Texas? It's great. Um, You know, I think we were, we were honestly one of the kind of, out of market test subjects for this early on because you know, we do uh, use a lot of, of fresh hop and wet hop and um, so what I love about it too is I you know I one of the hard things about bringing a wet hop into Texas is yeah you put it on an airplane it's overnighted down here there's a pretty big carbon footprint around that and so although this isn't like a small carbon footprint it's definitely smaller and I know YCH is doing a lot of studies on the carbon footprint of getting these hops out to brewers and um they're you know that's one thing that you know for me i i care a lot about it, that we can get this in a little bit more uh efficient way and we're not putting quite as much impact on the environment just to make a hot uh, beer that i want to make you know not completely selfish in that way um but for what it, what it's done for us is you know we've used a lot of different products uh the, so the beer that i sent you all layers of flavor it's a west coast pills uh, you know, thank, thank Bob down in uh, Highland for the, the future of uh, what is IPA. Uh, it's called West Coast Pills. It's, uh, we're, we found that we can use now all these hot products in different places. So, you know, this beer is uh, pellet through the, the kettle. It's um, whole leaf dried in the hot back and in the mash. It's... Um, Actually has some IQF in the in the hot back as well, which is the whole cone version of it that we've had in our freezer. Uh, it's got some T90, it's got some cryo, it's got some 301 in the dry hop. So we can create all these layers of flavor, hence the name, from all these different products. And I think it just it gives us another tool in the toolbox. And that's the thing that I love as a brewer is it's not a CO2 extract, it's not a flowable. I think those are great too, but this. It def- it's not uh, changing the aromatics or the flavor it, in, you know, we still know what farm this came off of and it, it still gives you a sense of place and it gives you this character that, uh, you know, for us in Texas, I, like when we were getting overnighted, they didn't come in as good as the IQ off do. You know, they were starting to brown a little bit. Like these are coming in, they smell just like I smelled them uh in uh well pre kill you know like it's it's amazing and you know that's you like these guys they're they're fortunate enough to go pick them and, and I, i've done some runs with both these guys and you see how fast hops degrade when you grab them from the farm and drive them back when they're wet and so this iqf process i think is it's really cool that you know they can get that in there and then they can cold chain ship it down to me and i can brew a beer with you know it's not a hundred percent it's we're using it at 20 or 30 percent you know we're just giving it that character that's trying to drive home some of that really fresh hop character that we love um and still make it really drinkable because at the end of the day we want something that you know you can drink a pint of multiple pints of you know i think we kind of spoke to it earlier but some of the the things about early fresh hops i remember drinking them 15 years ago um it was like okay grab 500 pounds of wet hop put them in a mash tun, run a beer through it. Uh, it was kind of undrinkable. I mean, it was cool, but like... Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, we did it at Odell, too, Steve. Like, we we suffered through the same thing. Like, we we all told ourselves it was really delicious. Uh, we drank four ounces of it, and then we all, like, we're like, yeah, this is, this is delicious, right? Yeah, and it's really good. Um, but I think we're getting more refined with that process. 
Great stuff on Fresh Hops from those guys. Of course, after we recorded that episode, a couple months later, I went up to, to Yakima with our, our videographer, and uh, we filmed a, a video class, spent the entire day with Zach rolling around to farms. I um, mean, that was the longest video day we've ever spent, 13 hours. Um, it was, wow. it was uh, and it's the longest video class, I think, I don't know, it was like an hour and 45 minute class. So if you want to see, you know, the, uh, all of that process of, of harvesting, of uh, pulling fresh hops, of, of grabbing them from farms, of going through pelletizing uh, as they do for dry hopping at, at Single Hill. Uh, you know, you are an all access subscriber to Craft Beer and Brewing, which you should be, right? I mean, everyone should be an all access. I mean, if you're if you're in the industry, you should probably be an all access. Yeah, get your subscription. Yeah, you know, so go check out those uh, that video on Fresh Hop Brewing with Zach from Single Hill, and then we're to the number six spot right here, and uh, this is where. Things get a little bit hazy, Chris. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Travis Fritz from Old Nation uh, M43, kind of a you know a big name in hazy IPA, uh, was not Travis's initial intention when launching the brewery, as he discussed in this episode, and uh, then saw the opportunity and approaches making hazy IPA with the discipline of a you know uh, logger focused trained. brewer trained yeah. exactly yeah yeah i i i really enjoyed this episode i haven't had the pleasure of of having his beers um yet but i will say i feel like i've ever heard i've heard every single you know music metaphor when it comes to beer and i got to say his might be my favorite <laughs> and it was when he he was talking about cuz he's also a musician and he talked about you know in logger if you're playing in an orchestra and you drop your cello and you're playing classical music, it ruins everything. He's like, but you know, in punk rock, if you drop your guitar, if your strap breaks or something, like who cares? Pick it back up and start, you know, playing. Um, and I thought that was a, a really clear and uh, well said metaphor for you know his sort of logger training versus the production of say hazy IPA. And not to say he's not applying some techniques and process and, and things that are quite precise to uh, his hazy IPA, but him understanding what the the tempo is supposed to feel like and taste like uh, was 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 really, I thought that was awesome. That was probably my favorite one I've heard. It, uh, yeah, this was a, I, I loved having this conversation and uh, yeah, we'll listen in for a little bit of it right now. Everybody knows somebody that went to Germany when they were a teenager or a young adult. And everybody is sick of the stories they tell about how great the beer is over there, right? And the truth is, the beer over in, in continental Europe, really, in Germany, is, is good, right? Now, if you're going to a dozen breweries, you will know this better than anyone, right? If you're going to a dozen breweries in continental Europe, will you find good beer? Absolutely, right? Will you find something that blows your socks off? Probably not, right? Right. That's not what they're there for, Right. Now, if you go to a dozen breweries here in the United States, you're absolutely liable to find a bunch of stuff that is horrible and a bunch of stuff that is just cosmically interesting, right? So that's the difference between the disciplines. To me, coming from music as well, um, for me, it's the difference between, you know, jazz or classical music and punk music, right? They both have their place. They're both important, but they're both important for different reasons. It's interesting for me then, and if I'm going too much in philosophy about this, man, just let's, feel free to let's, You're <laughs> using meta, music metaphors. <laughs> okay, so you, I give you a pass for that. All right, okay? good, good. Instantly. Um, good. Um, so as a person who studied classical music and jazz and, and played a lot, um, and particularly, you know, the, the, the genesis of that into, or, or the, the, the birth of that from modal folk music, um, I think that finding yourself within a box and, and, and instead of sort of saying, you know, my target is, you know, blowing people's mind, saying, look, my target is a small dot that moves around in this box, right? And where I position that dot within this box defines what it is that I make is an important exercise for anyone who is a professional to engage in, right? Because it, it necessitates restraint, right? Can I make a 10% beer? Fuck yeah, you can make a 10% beer, right? More sugar and a hearty yeast. It's done, right? Um, can I make a 10% beer that is really drinkable? That is a difficult nut to crack, right? Just as difficult as staying within the parameters of something that is 45 to 5.5% ABV, generally somewhere between 12 and 20 IBU, right? right? And is pretty much the same as everything else that is made in that same style is really complicated. And it's something you can spend a lifetime doing. 
And so for me, the Hellas that we sell here is more bitter than a continental Hellas would be. Um, it's come from 20 years of fucking How much more recipe. bitter do you mean? Uh, well, we're, that beer is about <clears throat> 17, 18 IBU. Um, and I would be more comfortable making a Hellas generally in kind of Europe around 13 or 14 mm -hmm. um, or 12. Um, but I, but I think that, you know, it's unless it, it's Shinram, in which case it might be even more bitter than that. Right. Exactly. And I'm not saying there aren't exactly yeah. right. It's all over the yeah. board, but you're choosing that thing. Right. So you're saying, I'm saying with that beer fundamentally, look, the, 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 the malt base, the fermentation is something that is kind of a foregone conclusion. It's very traditional, right? The way that we're processing this through ferment, uh, fermentation, we're not filtering it, so we're letting it hang in the tank for a long time. I mean, it's boring, easy stuff that everybody knows, right? Bumping that bitterness to where it is is a part of, of what makes that beer what it is, right? Um, the grain constituents within that beer and what we're selecting and how much of what Pilsner grain we're choosing to use in that, all this is for me, right? This is a Hellas beer. Right. What I need to give you is a beer with really good foam stability that looks nice and rocky. That's relatively bright in the glass, particularly from the context of an, unfam an unfiltered beer. And that, again, you can sit and enjoy. And if you care to ponder whether or not it's a good beer, hopefully the an answer is yes. And if you don't, hopefully that beer gets completely out of your way and lets you enjoy it the whole way through. Right. Does it pass the Zauf test? <laughs> right. So does it pass the idea that you can have your first beer in front of you and your first sip is about a third of the glass, right? It's easy. That's right? the Zauf test? The Zauf. Zaufen is, uh, so, Game uh, trinken means let's go have a drink, right? And that's what that means. Let's have a drink, right? And enjoy ourselves and then leave. Uh, Zaufen means you're going out to get drunk, right? Um, so if, uh, you, the beer should be, the beer is obviously going to be able to, to be drank, right? The question is, can you drink this beer, right? And when in drinking that beer, does it serve, does it still serve the same purpose, right? And so for me, the idea of traditional beer is, is, is less about what I can say on a craft brewing podcast about it, right? <laughs> and, 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 and more about- This is a giant safe space here. You <laughs> right. can say what you need to say. <laughs> and more about, how, does it impact a beer drinker in the way the beer right, drinker right. wishes to be impacted, right? I'm not confronting you with this beer. And I'm not confronting any of our drinkers about what's special about it. Because what's special about it is that I've been making this beer and refining this recipe for 20 fucking years. And you shouldn't care at all. Right. I'm putting my name on it because it's important to me. Right. You should care that it is exactly what you wanted when you opened up a can of yellow beer. That is the hardest thing to do. Right. It's the hardest thing to do in brewing. Anybody can make a ton. I do it. Right? I'm guilty sure, as anybody. Sure. Right. You can make a ton of noise. You can punch somebody in the face with something that tastes like mangoes. It's great. Right. That's how you get people's attention. That's what punk music is. Right. If I'm on a stage, which I've done, playing some loud ass punk music, right? I'm beating the shit out of my guitar. And if I drop it, who cares? Right. Drummer's still going. I'm gonna pick it up and keep going. Right. Doesn't ruin the song adds to the experience. Right. Now, if I'm in a concerto, right. And I'm playing cello and I drop my bow, the entire thing is fucked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's really important to be able to do both as a brewer or a musician or an athlete or, or a banker. I mean, whatever you do. Smart stuff from Travis Fritz of Old Nation. Um, number five, we're now into our top five episodes of the year. Number five actually wasn't a brewing focused episode at all. It's a, it's not, you know, it's a little bit unusual take for us. Um, but at the same time, I reached out to Doug Veliki of uh, Revolution uh, in episode 287. Doug also runs the Beer Aficionado uh, social media accounts where he engages in humorous content there. Um, but also one of the smartest beer marketers that I know and uh, also just a, a thoughtful uh, uh, commenter on both the you know, state of beer business and the state of beer culture at the same time. Uh, he had posted a in really interesting blog post shortly before this, and I thought it would, might be useful to unpack that. Um, so I reached out and uh, you know, got in his thoughts then in January about uh, what was going on in beer. You know, and some of that is uh, you know, certainly proved out to be true, interesting, and impactful over the course of the year. Yeah, I think uh, Doug's opinions are super valuable. 
you know, and I, and, and I don't even think to, I'm not even necessarily saying like he's predicting necessarily anything as much as he, he has a great way of assessing the industry and then, uh, putting it into terms that really make sense on not just a production scale, not just a market scale. Um, but, but even a, a sales side, right. Um, looking at, at how to adjust, how they have adjusted rather revolution, you know, their, what they make and what they, how they, what they name things. Um, and of course his, I mean, his Instagram's hilarious. He's constantly commenting on the industry and I think very clever, thoughtful ways that is is making fun of itself. Even things that he has the opinion that he likes, he'll make fun of um, in ways that I think represent the market in a very healthy manner um, and, an, and an easy way to sort of digest what I think a lot of us are either thinking or feeling without really being able to articulate it. And so he's, he's a, I think he's a very important voice um, in our industry right now. I 100% agree. Let's take a listen. I have this like imaginary line in my head that is, is the year 2015 and uh, before 2015, uh, you know, give or take of course, but um, that's where I felt uh, building a brand went from easy ish, to really, really hard in terms of back then, like people will ask me like, you know, we, we, we launched Antihero in 2010. It technically 2012 is when it went into cans. And then in 2015, we released my favorite beer, which is Fist City, our pale ale. And I have all these people say like, I can't believe Fist City isn't bigger than Antihero. No offense, but I like Fist City so much more. And I'm like, no offense taken. I, I drink 10 Fist Cities for every one Antihero. I just love pale ales. It's like my favorite beer. Um, but I always tell them like Antihero came out in 2012 when there was like six breweries in Chicago. And it was like the first brewery that screamed IPA and went for it and made itself uh, accessible in like all the stores. And we just kind of went for it early. Um, Fist City came out in this 2015, push into 2016 timeframe when there was a hundred and some breweries in Chicago and everybody was throwing out everything and a brand starts to sort of get lost. And it, what, uh, launching a new brand wasn't as like, you didn't just get this instant notoriety. Back then, if you launched a new brand, it would just show up and everybody saw it on the store shelf. You didn't have to do anything for it. People would want to try it because there just wasn't an overwhelming amount of new like there is today. So now it's all about prioritization. So like if a concept for a new beer or we have the liquid because we are always making just one offs at our brew pub and on just like our one barrel system, the concept for a new beer comes up and people say, hey, Doug, we think that this could be something big. The question always has to be, is it big enough to be one of our top three or maybe even top five priorities? Because we, my head always goes to our sales team. How many things can you give our sales team and say, give this focus? You cannot do that to 12 things. And we have over 12 products, but there's certain things. There's only so many, especially with something new that requires education, requires explaining over and over again. They can only t ask a store to carry so many things or a bar. They can only run through so many to, and, and encouraging the bar. This would make sense for you. Um, so you sometimes a concept will come to me and I'll say, do you see this being something that we push harder than Antihero, Hazy Hero, Freedom Lemonade, Fist City and this? And they're like, well, no. And I'll say, well, just so you know, that's never going to be successful unless we decide, yes, it is. So there's just only so many products you can go big with. And this kind of ties into a, a, another trend happening. This isn't something I really wrote about in my uh, preview post, but um, this idea of brand extension, something that's been happening for 10 years. We've been every IPA for the most part we've made for 10 years has the word hero in it. So everyone, we create our own like Marvel universe of our own hero characters and theme them around the type of IPA we're making. That's been happening and other breweries have their own versions of that Firestone with the Jacks, um, Bells with the, the, the hard eds. It's been happening. It's nothing new, but all of a sudden we're seeing a, a, a snowball effect of like a, more of these than we ever thought were possible are happening right now. And the biggest benefit of these, like building a whole family of brands, like a, a recent one was Dead Guy, uh, Rogue Dead Guy Ale also uh, launched Dead Guy IPA. Yeah. And I said, like, this makes a lot of sense to me because now your sales team can go in and talk about 
dead guy as a as a family and they can like have one thing they're talking about that could represent two and i'm sure someday there'll be a third dead guy and maybe a fourth but it, it just simplifies this complicated world that every brewery has built for themselves nobody has a simple portfolio for the most part everybody has done more and more and more and now these uh these brand extensions and keeping ipas with something in common like all of them having hearted in it all of them having jack in it in our case all, all of them having hero in it just makes it easier to explain that if you see hero you know that's a, a riff on ipa of some kind from revolution and so that that's something we look for with our new brands to come back to your original question of how do we how do we help give this life as we it, it is very helpful to help tie it in to something else you do because at this point people are so lost and overwhelmed with too many new beer brands so how can you give this new thing something familiar with something else you've done that they know they liked so if you liked this hero there's a decent chance you might like this one too because they have that word hero in common with it Smart stuff from Doug, and uh, you know I'm gonna have to make, make it a yearly occasion to to check in with Doug. I, I saw him at Fobab. We talked about some other stuff there, and uh, every time I have a conversation with him, I, I feel like I come away a little bit smarter. Um, speaking of folks that uh, that make me smarter, in the fourth spot. Um, this episode 307, this was uh, an episode, uh, episode that we took from a, a, a panel on hazy IPA brewing that took place at our brewer's retreat in, uh, at Russian River this, uh, this past May. A, an experience that honestly, and I mean, I, I say how you feel. <laughs> this was one of the best, the best experiences that I've had in my life. Awesome. Not, not just in work and business, but it was one of the most exciting experiences that I've had. And um, what a, an amazing thing to be able to, to, to be a part of putting together and help shape the, the creative vision of. Um, and, you know, throughout the course of the event, we kept having people say, oh, what are you going to do this again? And like, let's not talk about that. Let's, let's just, just experience. Let's yeah. just soak this up because this is magical right now. And I think it was magical and, and exciting for everyone from all of our guest brewers who were there to all the attendees of the event. And just being able to experience it was just, it was extraordinary and special. And uh, I'm just glad that in this world that we can help make some of these things exist because it's cool that they even exist. Um, that's how I felt about the that brewer's retreat and then all the brewer's retreats in the past. This episode, um, uh, episode uh, or no, number four spot, was a conversation with Henry from Monkish, uh, JC from Trillium, Neil from Weldworks on Hazy IPA. And it, it actually kind of caught me by surprise. I, I think, uh, you know, and a lot of the feedback that I heard from other brewers after this was realizing that some of the ways they thought people were making hazy IPA were not exactly the way that some of the leading hazy IPA makers are actually making hazy IPA. Um, and, but it was nice to hear that, that viewpoint and, and realize that there are lots of very valid and very effective ways of making these that, uh, you know, that kind of span, you know, old school, new, new school and everything else. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it was really cool to, I mean, Henry's, Henry's uh, you know, history with Hazy is really fascinating. Um, him being inspired by people like JC from, you know, Trillium, uh, tasting those beers and saying, oh, I get it, you know, and then being so fascinated, you know, with that, being able to to work with Sam at Other Half to develop what we now know Monkish is um, and what they sort of bring to the table. And then, you know, obviously Neil at Weldworks, uh, you know, really building a bit of an empire off juicy bits. Um, you know, uh, three, three, three brewers in different parts of the country, uh, pursuing a character in beer that is, uh, you know, it, it's familiar throughout, but the way they each do it is slightly different. And so, yeah, the, the pathways to, to, to the end, end point uh, aren't, aren't always exactly the same. And I think it, it shows that there's a lot more freedom in Hazy IPA than people realize, um, which is which is really cool to hear. No, it's nice to not have it be a monocultural type of approach and to find that uh, the way people find balance and focus on the flavors uh, can be very personal, individual, you know, and, you know, evoke that brewery's brand. Well, let, let's take a quick listen. Uh, I think it has to do with our water primarily and pretty high in sulfate. Um, lots of TDS. They made that TDS count as unreal. Mm. Um, and we always knew we had that um, 
like very strong minerality, you know, always whatever we would like try early on, we always had that, like that sharpness, that bite. And so I had to contemplate whether I want the softness that I was trying in some of these beers, but I knew that our water was creating this. And the more I thought about what we we're trying to do, it seemed like that what we're able to get with the hops and that biotransformation just kind of give this really strong, like pungency of, I don't know, but I always still call it like, a, like every time we like make one of these beers, we're always looking for a wow factor. If we're trying a new lot of Citra, whatever, we're like, we're looking for this punchy, pungent, yet creamy, like candy quality. And so we want that to be kind of like the initial mid palate and then allowing our, our water to kind of dry it out. And, and then finding out, you know, being a Belgian brewery, it actually fits us better because it's, you know, it allows this very experiential beer to still dry out your palate, maybe be like a digestive, you know, like for, you know, Belgians, so that you would want the next drink rather than have a lingering sweetness that doesn't um, help you with a, a finish. Using the water to dry it out. I, I love that. What level of uh, total dissolved solids uh, do you end up with in this water? It's uh, close to 500. Which oh, is, man. Uh, so it's it's barely within legal Jeez. limits. <laughs> <laughs> All, almost Jester King levels. I think they're at, what, 700 or something? Yeah. I mean, it's it's insane. From their raw water? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty, like, I, there was this uh, Netflix show with Zac Efron where he goes to, like, taste water, and he goes all the different TDS, and you could just see their facial expression when they're trying, like, a 2,000 or 5,000 TDS water. And um, it's been something I've been very sensitive like I think we were in last year in Slovenia and there was this, um, uh, their, just their mineral, like Pellegrino bottle. It was so high TDS, you tasted it. I'm like, so I'm online trying to check for TDS level. I'm like, yep, I'm pretty been sensitive with high TDS. It's something we struggle with a lot, especially the past couple of years, the TDS level. It's been kind of more perceived, mm. so. We, uh, we stay for episode, for our third number three episode of the year we stay in this kind of hazy ipa realm uh i knew it was going to happen obviously <laughs> ipa ipa just has to you know dominate the conversation uh in craft beer I, you know I, I shouldn't i shouldn't throw shade at it that way because i drink a lot of ipa myself I IPA love is IPA. wonderful yeah, yeah, IPA, yeah ipa built our market really um you, you could argue i mean it's still the most dominant style um at this point we're calling everything ipa because it's so dominant <laughs> and it because works itself. yeah <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, so this one also on Hazy IPA, uh, episode number 288, BKS Artisan Ales. Uh, Brian and Mary Rooney talked to me remotely from uh, their spot in Kansas City, and we talked about um, their approach uh, to really to kind of shaving the edges of, of reducing the kind of angular character in beers so that things feel you know, more palatable, softer, smoother. Um, and more around. It was a, it was an interesting conversation, and they have you know continued to find su success there with BKS, um, and or even one of our uh, beers of the year this yeah, year. Look at that. Those choices, yeah, yeah. Well, um, as as a uh, previously sitting beer of the year uh, member, that's right. Um, that's congratulations, right. first and foremost. Uh, it's a big deal, and yeah, I mean, you know, hazy IPA. I think um, you know we just talked about it, kind of having the ability to be all sorts of different things and having freedom. And I think like uh, over overall, beer itself, you know, we we always are searching as producers for drinkability, um, while also trying to balance like drinkability with a interest and excitement and something special. And I think hazy IPAs, uh, you know, for me at least, became interesting once the drinkability factor made sense to me, right? The antithesis sort of of maybe bitterness or something that might be challenging to someone else's palate. And I, I do like bitterness, but there is something beautiful about cutting the edges off of off of things, making things palatable, palatable, making things drinkable. And and I guess when you apply drinkability to anything and that's your goal, um, then you're probably going to make a lot of people happy. Um, and Kansas City is is having a moment with beer right now, I think. Um, it's a wonderful beer town. Um, and this episode was awesome to kind of yet again hear another producer think about drinkability and think about how to make things um, exciting, but also consumable. 
Let's take a listen. For us, like we're going for almost like a lager water expression in, in our hazy beer. And so we're not far off of that. We go a little bit lower on lager with TDS. We get um, pretty low with Czech, um, you know, more German type of expression. We're like in, in a little bit step above that. But like our, our, uh, our hazy IPA is not far off the mark from that. But it's got a little bit more calcium and chloride to it. So we start from there. Um, as we go through the brewing process on that, um, we like to bring our kettle pH down quite a bit lower than is traditional. And some of that stuff is proprietary for us. I think that those things do lead to haze stability. But I encourage people to play around with that, like go beyond what you know. Don't just take the uh, the standard numbers that you may have heard or whatever. Try Try to take a little lower. And so my... My advice on that is, you know, I think that if you read a lot about what makes a good Belgian wit, uh, is it acidifying the wort quite a bit to a little bit of a lower level? It's like, but those are those are haze stable with that yeast. And so we started taking a page from like Belgian brewing to look at like, well, wouldn't that work for like what we're trying to do with our with our English yeast essentially? And then we found it to be true. But the other nice thing that I think happens with a lower kettle pH um specifically in the whirlpool is that we get like a a softer bitterness and those beers are all about softness and it's like if you get like any like blocky angular harsh bitterness that's in there i feel like it's it can be out of place for hazy beer and so we're trying to create softness with drinkability without being cloying sweetness and so one of the things that i think a lot of people might be surprised about is that our beers don't finish with a high residual gravity on hazy beer, but they finish with like this, like fluffier, softer sort of mouthfeel that's in the beer. And I think that that comes from the water. And I think that comes from the pH, like we're landing, you know, I, I'm, I'm a home brewer, so I still do gravity and I'm like, um, 1016, 1014. I think that's like two, five Play-Doh something around there, but like, we're not, we're not super high, like, uh, where we finish with our beers on, on hazy beer but it still leaves enough behind that there's like enough to like go back and drink it and want to keep sipping on it. All right. We're now into our top two episodes of the year. And uh, you know, I did fudge a little bit. So this, this is our top two, right? It's our top, <laughs> I'll explain more. I'll explain more on, on the, the top two of three. <laughs> Something like that. Exactly. And our number two spot for the year, episode number 310, uh, featuring Justin Burt of ghost town. This was not surprisingly, uh, favorite of a lot of podcast listeners this year um, because obviously, you know, Justin and Ghost Town have been crushing it. They had back to back gold medals uh, at GABF in the Imperial IPA category. Uh, this one obviously is focused on West Coast IPA and the way that they make West Coast IPA is absolutely inspiring. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Nose Goblin from Ghost Town was one of our beers of the year this year also. Uh, not that it needed that acclaim on top of everything else that it's got, but here it is. Uh, um, you know, uh, what Justin's doing at Ghost Town and some of his kind of counterintuitive ways of thinking about selecting hops, um, you know, and building blends of hops, you know, I think they... They surprised me that I was, I certainly wasn't expecting some of the things that he was telling me. Yeah. I think as, especially as producers, like who didn't want to know what they were doing you know, with the success that they've had and, and the intensity that their beers provide while still again, being drinkable. Um, you know, I, I think he's one of those brewers that, that definitely focus on, on competition and how to make those. And he talks about that a lot in, in this podcast. He talks about how to produce a beer that you know in X amount of months is going to be up for, you know, on a table, um, which I think is super, super important for people that if that's your focus and that's your goal and you enjoy that competition, that competitive side of things, um, really, really great information. Uh, he made me look back at Mosaic again. I remember him talking about Mosaic as his favorite hop in this, in this episode. Um, and it made me want to go back and revisit. We use a lot of Mosaic, but it's usually in combination with things. And, and what he looks for in Mosaic is not necessarily dissimilar to what we look for. It's just something that I, I just really didn't think about as much as he did. Um, so that was fun. It's really cool when, you know, you're sort of inspired to revisit something that, you know, not that you take for granted, but that you're, you feel comfortable with. Uh, and so he made, he made me, uh, he made me think through our hops a little bit more. Interesting. The one thing he didn't tell me on this episode is something another brewer told me after the fact is like, he didn't tell you 
about his one percent crystal malt, right? Oh yeah, see yeah. that's a little dirty secret. It was one yeah. percent crystal malt? That, I guess he didn't want to own up to that one. Anyway, that, that, that rumor has it that that's another secret that Justin uses. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll listen to a little clip here. Let's talk uh, mosaic, um, which is, in my opinion, to this day, still the best hop out there, uh, in my opinion. But like when we're going, it's not really a hot take. I mean, that's a great hop. I mean, it, it just plays well with others, sure. and it plays well by itself. You know, Citru- I mean, we we all know what the really awesome hops are. But um, yeah, for us, like for me, you know, um, when I'm going in for the hop, the one thing I found that worked really well was it's more coming from a sensation standpoint and not necessarily uh, I'm looking for, you know, uh, blackberry at this point, passion fruit at this point, you know, like I'd kind of dropped the adjectives and just went straight for sensations. Like, you know, cause we're, we're, I would say we're still brewing on an artistic standpoint more than a scientific stand, you know, you know, we kind of let our ingredients do what they do to us. But like, to me, like awesome mosaic, uh, and, 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 and real quick to be clear, we do select multiple lots. So we pick different kind of flavor points just to Fancy. nowadays. We, do. We, we didn't do this then yeah. we, we can do that now. So now we can doing that much more volume where you can have multiple. Different yes. We, yeah. Lots. We'll, we'll have our T nineties from two different suppliers and our cryo from YCH We're YCH heavy, uh, you know, cause they're awesome products, but, um, you anyway, know, like we go in for mosaic and let's just say our, our, the 75%, the heavy mosaic that we go for um, is going to be uh, what heavy, I would call the heavy mosaic. Well, what I'm, my yeah. dank, my dank ass yeah, motherfucking yeah, yeah. shit. I look for fucking armpit. I look for burying the background, but then I do this, the way I call it is it's like that wasabi sting, you know, like when you do wasabi and you get mm-hmm. that nostril sting right up between your eyes. If you rub the, let's say like it comes down to two different lots right in front of you and they're both giving you everything you like, you go for the one that has that, I don't know what the chemical is that's coming off of it, but it gives you the sensation. And we, that's kind of like my go-to for their, like our mosaic or citras or Simcoe's and all that, you know, like we'll find my our, mosaic has to hurt. It does. It's got to hurt. It No, uh, but yeah. you know, but in a great I mean, way. And the, the most metal thing that uh, you've said so far in this podcast which for a brewery that's so predicated on metal is, is pretty awesome. Fucking hurts, brother. Yeah. Uh, no, no. But uh, yeah, no, it's, and to me, that's like, it, I, it comes across as dank as fuck in our beers, you know? And, um, and we still get that berry undertone from it that you might be looking for. But like with our mosaics, they're, I mean, you tried a, a beer earlier, you know, it, they're, um, we're not soft with our mosaics. Like I do have a lot of mosaic that are softs and those are good to our hazies, but our West Coast, you know, we want aggressive. Like I said, it's it's armpit and dank. And um, and can I drop farm names right now? Like sure, sure. Brulot Farms. They, we've been getting uh, Reggie's Mosaic for the last three years. Mosaic is one of the main hops in all of our award-winning beers. And it's, like I said, our stuff is just it's dank as fuck. And it's funny, one of our local buddies in the area, I won't drop their name, but they selected their lot you know, just talking to us. And then they're like, dude, all of our beers keep tasting like ghost town beers, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you know, they're like, it's just too dank though. It's like, we need, we need, we need to dial back the fruitiness, you know, or, or get it back to that fruity aspect. But um, no, I mean, mad, mad props to Brewlot Farms. Uh, Cause yeah. uh, we've selected blindly three years in a row from uh, Reggie's stuff and uh, we love it. And to me, that's just, you know, yeah, we still, yeah, I mean, we still dry hop at the four pound per barrel kind of thing like most people do, but that's kind of like for most like that's what we look for you know other hops i'm happy to talk about a few other varieties if you sure want, yeah but, let's talk um, about other hop varieties like we can go like like citra so yeah. we have a, a citra is probably we buy the most of citra because we have a flagship ipa in hume that's citra dominant it's about 60 percent citra and for that one um you know we definitely go for the melon aspect of it but I, and I was scolded actually last year by a couple of brewers. I won't name their names, but I still look for that little like cat pee kind of thing. And everyone's like, that's an off flavor. You can't do that. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and in hindsight too, let's keep this real. Like scolded through the selection process or scolded, uh, drinking a beer at single Hill, talking to some brewers who I'd never met before told me that I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, because nobody looks for that kind of thing. That's an off flavor and citra. Yada, yada. But, I'm happy with it. I like how our citra beers come out, you know, and uh, wow. And that brings us to our best episode of the year, which is actually 
two episodes. We're going <laughs> to, you know, I, I figured it would be unfair if we had the same crew in the number one and the number two spot, taking up a spot for somebody I think somebody that's fair. So I mean, just, at that point, you'd bump 10 out of the whole thing. So there was no reason to do that. Exactly. And so, so in our number one spot, we have both episodes 286 and episode 300, West Coast IPA Now and West Coast IPA Now revisited the direct fire version. Of course, this panel discussion with Vinny Chalurzo, Evan Price of Green Cheek, Kelsey McNair of North Park, quickly not only became our best episode of the year, but has over the course of this past year uh, become our most downloaded episode in the history of the podcast. Wow. Surpassing. And, and the, the previous uh, you know, most downloaded episode is episode number one of the podcast uh, with Garrett Oliver. You know, and it was the first episode, and of course, you know, it's the one that if anyone goes back, you're going to go back to number one, you're going to listen to it. Of course, it's going to be the, you know, a top episode. For sure. Um, but to watch what this episode did, it is now, I just checked before we started here, over 71,000 downloads um, over the course of less than one year now. Uh, kind of a phenomenal number for us, uh, something that we just don't usually see numbers. It takes a long time for brewer, you know, numbers to, to get uh, to even half of that point. Um, they certainly don't get to where they uh, – anyway. Well, especially in the short amount of time. Right. The fact that you right. hit that number in a year is insane. So and, – and now uh, episode 300 that we followed it up with, uh, um, the uh, West Coast IPA now revisited – uh, is over fifty thousand downloads, wow. and it is climbing. It, it is, uh, it's getting pretty close to, uh, you know, to the Garrett Oliver episode now itself, and so it will probably take the number two spot sometime here pretty soon. Crazy to see it, cool to see it, um, but also again, just fun that we can hit a note. Um, get on a topic that brewers want to listen to, uh, and the amount of uh, feedback, the number of people that listen to that. Uh, the number of the, the, you know, who we heard from who was listening to that was, was just kind of remarkable and fun. I thought it was the year of the lager, Jamie. What happened? Well, it's, it's, it's the year of making IPAs with lager yeast <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and uh, Pilsner Malt, right? I yeah. mean, it's, that's all, all the year of the lager. It all works together that way, right? Who, who, <laughs> and, like, who doesn't want to hear from Vinny? Uh, who doesn't want to hear from Evan? I mean, North Park's beers are amazing. Like, uh, when you talk about IP producers, you know, especially obviously looking at the West Coast, you're talking about a group of people that make, you know, I, I think maybe the best, the best, probably for sure, I do think that Vinny makes the best West Coast IP I ever had in my life. Um, I, you know, Evan is not only making incredible West Coast IPA, but he's also making incredible like New England IPA. Um, and it's not to say that it's the same as IPA that I have in New York or Vermont or whatever, but he, his, his, you know, I brewed a collab with him here. We brewed uh, a hazy IPA together. Um, and his process and his techniques to get the most out of those hops is, is pretty rad. And it's cool to see that like they're all making these beers. And of course I don't want to leave out North park because everything I've had from them is awesome, including like West coast pills and everything's great. Um, but they, they, they all have, uh, different, you know, viewpoints on hops, like how they select is very different, which was actually the part that I found the most intriguing, right? Hearing Vinny talk about what he looks for in repeating lots every year, um, versus, you know, how, you know, Evan, when he's like, yeah, I don't really select, you know, I select the pellets afterwards. So the, the fact that they're, they're all getting, they're eking out the most they can out of everything. Uh, the fermentation process, um, that North Park has is also different than the rest of them. Um, so yeah, it's just, there's so much knowledge to unpack and there's so many different ways to make this thing that we love. Um, and three of the best producers that I've had, um, are, are making them not necessarily the same, but it's also was really rad to see how much of a fan they were of each other. Um, and that was probably my favorite part of the episode was, you know, hearing how much the people at Russian river love, you know, green cheek and North park beers. Um, that that's, that's huge. It's really cool. Let's take a listen. When we get to dry hopping, if we are over, I think our number is 5.3, we'll make a pH adjustment at dry hopping as well. At, so when we're adding the dry hops to the top of the fermenter, we'll maybe add a little food grade phosphoric acid. And, and to me, food grade lactic acid is a little obvious and it's it's a little fake if you will whereas phosphoric they'll tell you is a little more coarse but i think that 
goes nicely in an IPA. So sometimes we'll actually four, make. Three, you mean four three, not five three, right in the fermenter? Four three. Sorry, my so bad. Yeah, just, you guys all have to correct me. So, um, <laughs> and because because the thing is, is that four six is food safety, or four five five somewhere in there. Four five four six is food safety. So you know that's that's something where the beer industry needs to. Um, probably be a little more focused on that you know the fda does technically have jurisdiction over us and if if we have beer over four six and this continue and there's a lot of breweries who are serving beer over four six that's technically food that's unsafe and so i think it's something we should be um focused on but so we'll we'll maybe like four three is our is sort of our our number where if it's above maybe we'll make a an adjustment with food grade phosphoric. Um, but we have this unique system at our Windsor facility with our big brewery in that we built in on the back of the cones of all the tanks. We have a two inch uh, port that we have a portable tank mixer that we can move from tank to tank. So it's really easy for us to add say phosphoric acid. Let's say we're at four or five pH and we want to get to four three knowing that dry hopping is going to increase the pH. Yep. Another interview question when you I'm sometimes not, I, yes. That one. <laughs> um it is that and so we can lower the pH from say four or five to four three for example and then we dry hop and then the dry hop takes it back up to four or five but we're still in a good spot. And because uh, it because the beers get really flabby if they're over to me personally, if they're over four, six. And um, but it but it can all start at knockout when you're, you know, in your whirlpool and maybe you, you start making additions there. You know, Evan and Kelsey, uh, where, do, where do you guys lie on that? You know, the knockout pH um, somewhere I settled in on like five, one, five. Um, I, you know, it. it we're sometimes it's five one, sometimes it's five one five, but it's like right in that pocket. Um, yeah, I had never done any uh, post uh, fermentation or or during or pre dry hop uh, pH adjustments, and you know um, the food safety consideration thing has me kind of like a little worried. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I, I mean, but I, I, you know, just looking through some of our logs here, uh, it's not unusual for our West Coast IPAs to end up in like, you know, 465 to 47. Um, and I'd say that's, you know, fairly typical. Uh, so maybe we're on the higher end um, of what, you know, where we should be. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's usually our dry hop pH. We dry hop ends up being like 4.4 ish. Um, so yeah, the paper shuffling in the background is Evan looking through brew logs, <laughs> looking at Evan's pH ner- numbers, nervously checking to see where he is. Yes, <laughs> and and you know, for all of us, it's the angel devil, and we all have John Mallet on one of our shoulders, going oh like food God. safety. Yeah, that guy, that well, I mean, like, yeah, I, he's so good. Yeah, but we're in the, like that seven and a half percent ABV environment, so you know what's gonna. What, what are we worried about, really? <laughs> you know, one one interesting thing when you, Jamie, when you talk about pH, that I think is another like cool tool in the brewer's toolkit is your kettle pH, and it's kind of it's kind of going backwards because we're working through the process. But like, you know, if if you lower your pH in your in the kettle to say to to closer to what we're talking about here so your whole boil is is at this number you're also like getting less utilization and it's less bitter and whereas a higher ph let's say you're at i'm just going to throw out five five in in the kettle compared to five or five one like you're you are going to get more utilization out of more isomerization out of those hops so you do end up with a more bitter beer so you know i i think in general like ph is something that for all styles is something that really needs to be remembered and focused on and and like yeah and don't forget to like 
you know, calibrate your pH meters. Those things get out of calibration in a blink. Man. Yeah. You know, we, we calibrate I, our pH meters every day. So and even on the pilot brewery at Santa Rosa, Windsor, that's a, that's a thing we do every morning if we're brewing is we, we recalibrate those, those, those handheld pH meters. We're a little looser. We're once a week, but I, uh, um, uh, I totally echo what you're saying, Vinny, uh, with in regards to the hop utilization aspect of the boil, like, um, we purposely, um, target certain pHs, um, for different beers for that, for the boil mark in order to either get a better utilization of those hops. So some beers, um, I purposely want a bitier um, hop expression, a more bitterness. And so um, we're going at the high end at 5.4. Um, and other beers, we're going on the lower end at, say, 5.2 um, or even as low as 5.1 uh, for certain lager styles um, in order to, um, to not get as much utilization from those hops on purpose and um, you know, for some of those loggers and, and like get, get fullness. And so I think that there's, um, it's such a great thing to bring up that not a lot of people talk about that as such a, uh, you know, as you say, a, a tool in the toolkit where it's just, um, something that, yeah, just something that people don't talk about. And especially if you have like five IPAs on your board, it's a cool way to differentiate yep. between them aside from hop hop varieties like we all know the, you know the difference between hop varieties but it's it's a cool way to say like this one's more bitter and and yet you as a brewer are taking this super technical approach to to doing it by just dealing with ph and there it is our number one episode of the podcast this year episode number 286 and 300 um <laughs> with a combined 120 some odd thousand downloads wow. uh, this year kind of insane honestly um but if you were a fan of that episode on west coast ipa with that crew i have some good news for you um, just as you were just mentioning before the clip that uh you know of course evan and kelsey are both pretty badass hazy IPA makers. Um, they pitched to me, we were down at uh, Homebrew Con in, in June, and uh, we, uh, we were set up next to them pouring the collab beers from the Brewer's Retreat uh, for Russian River, and then you know Evan and, and Kelsey were next door. And after, the, after that, uh, Evan's like, we should do a hazy IPA panel. <laughs> oh, there we go. It's like, well, that sounds interesting. There we like, go. Well, what do you want to do? It's like, well, we should do a hazy IPA panel. We should get Steve from Fiden's. Now um, you're talking. Steve Parker from Fiden's. And so, um, so anyway, that was going to happen. It was going to happen at, at uh, GABF this year, and then it didn't happen at GABF this year. But we've got that episode now scheduled and on the books uh, for the one-year anniversary of the West Coast Now uh, episode. And so Steve from Biden is going to join Kelsey and Evan, and I'm going to have a, a special guest host co-hosting with me for that episode and I bet you can guess who that special <laughs> guest host is going to be. Can't wait. It's going to be fun. Um, but Chris, thanks for uh, joining me to count down our top 10 episodes of the podcast this year. Um, you know, as we, as we get out of here, uh, what do you, what do you both, um, you know, what's your biggest concern for 2024 and what's your biggest hope for 2024? Uh, great questions. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to start with, uh, yeah, we'll start with the concern and then we'll go to the hope. We'll end on, end on a high note. Um, my biggest concern is, is, um, is essentially this sort of this, I guess, dragging out of kind of the end of this year in the next year. You know, I think most people that I speak to, not just in the beer industry, but especially in that, um, had a pretty rough summer. You know, the summer was tough on everybody. Um, uh, numbers were kind of down when it comes to, you know, uh, profit margins. And, um, however, at the end of the year, you know, what, I, what I'm hopeful about is we finished really, really strong. You know, our summer was as worse as honestly, personally, it was as worse as we've ever had, but we made it through and we finished higher than we did last year. So we're growing, um, which is, you know, makes us very excited about the future. We, uh, we hope to continue to sort of push growth and, and come up with new and interesting ways of, of keeping the people that are interested, continue to make them interested and, uh, continuing to grow, 
um, ourselves as brewers and as business owners. Um, I mean, we just turned 10, right? So it's hard to not be optimistic and excited. I mean, that's insane. The reflection's crazy. Um, who we are now versus then, we're so much better at so many different things than we were then. So it's really difficult to not be extremely hopeful for our industry as a, as a, as a whole. Um, you know, we're selling more beer than we ever have. I think the, if you actually look at the numbers, more beer is being sold than it ever has been. Um, definitely inflation and some of those constraints are keeping those profits down and it doesn't necessarily feel as optimistic um, as it really is. But making sure that you look at both sides of those numbers, making sure that you know, like, all right, there is growth. Now we just need to be prepared to make decisions to to get the most out of that growth rather than just sort of relying on what things are, because that's what evolution is. And that's what growth is. And, you know, I, you know, we plan on being here another 10 years. So, um, that's what we're excited about. We're excited about the next 10 years. You know, I, I agree with you. There are some significant challenges across the entire economy. They're not centered solely on beer or the entire beverage industry. They are economy wide, mm -hmm. you know, and these are tough things to unwind. Um, and they are negatively impactful for a lot of small businesses and a lot of even medium sized businesses and whatnot. Having said that, uh, he, he, it does appear like our overall economy mm -hmm. is going to hit a softer landing than what we could have seen from this. For sure. Yeah. And being able to get inflation under control and getting some stability around there, you know, it's hard to say like, oh, there's a silver lining to this uh, when people's businesses, they're losing their businesses. Um, that is a hard thing to, to say, but you know, it, looks like it could have been much worse than for this. For sure, for sure. Uh, and to, to be able to land from the kind of, you know, high inflation environment, you know, that we were in and not end up in a recession that mm -hmm. would close a lot more businesses, that's pretty, you know, that's a pretty significant positive. That, that's a win, yeah. Um, but I think I think what you said is absolutely right. The, the biggest win is that uh, it's not the end of craft beer. This is not the apocalypse. No, no, um, no. This is a challenging situation that all, you know, the entire hospitality and packaged uh, beverage industry will move through. Um, but one thing is true that the quality of the products that people are making, the quality of the beer, cider, of fermented spirit or ferment, fermented beverages, of now craft spirits, you know, everything else has never been better than it's, it is it's, now. It, the qu quality is better now than it's ever been. Ever. For sure. I completely agree. We, we have hit a high point and it's this culture of working together and of sharing and of helping everyone get better at it that makes the entire category it, it just strengthens the, the roots here. You know, we watched craft beer in the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, get hit and, you know, fall down and have to pick itself back up. And in picking itself back up, uh, decided to help everyone, you know, sh uh, share and make better beer. Because if people trust the category, then they're more likely to take risks and they're more like likely to feel confident when they are spending money on this product that's all, you know, encapsulating the idea of craft beer. And now I think the consumer confidence in craft beer is still high, whether it's going to stay, you know, whether it drops a few points, that's okay. You yeah, know? yeah. When we look at where we were 10 years ago and where we are now, uh, it's remarkably different. The amount of consumers that are comfortable, confident, and enjoy craft beer is so much larger than it once was in the quality of beer that people are making today versus 20 years ago. I mean, it's night and day. It's yeah, night and, day. and I, think, I think ultimately as a consumer base, you, know, you, you, you first and foremost have ex, uh, exposure, right? Knowing that this thing exists is required. And then the next step is exploring it. And then the last one is sort of finding that comfort, understanding where, where quality is, where quality isn't. Um, what I'm gonna, what I'm comfortable spending versus what I'm not, um, and I think the market is showing maturity in that sense. The consumer is showing maturity in that sense, and the consumers also showing knowledge, right? Understanding what is being put out, what they're being sold, um, has never been stronger um, when it comes to craft and and even food in that in that sense here in the United States, I, I for sure. Um, and you know, it's it is also a credit to things like craft beer and brewing magazine and and being a subscriptor or subscri subscription holder to your magazine is is 
a part of the way, part of how like we stay connected. It's a part of how we find out about techniques and process and quality and understanding those things and, and having, having a, a hub or a, a website to go to or a magazine to look at or a podcast to listen to, uh, to hear some of these incredible people that we just talked about, um, this, this top 10 list. The reason they're top 10 and the reason uh, that so many people are downloading it is because there's so much valuable information to be had, to be shared, and to be listened to. And so uh, that, that's why people are excited because there's still, ultimately at the end of the day, there's still so much to learn about beer. There's still so much to explore and there's still entirely too much to be excited about for it to feel like the end of the world. Chris, I love you, man. Let's. Uh, I'm going to go into 2024 with my mantra, and I hope everyone can join me in this one. Let's continue in 2024 making craft beer better together. You, you I'm in. <laughs> That's all I ever want. <laughs> well, let's bring it to a close at that. GD Chillers to set the standard on quality, service, and reliability with 24-7 service and support. Carries Firm Cap Eco reduces foam height to improve foam stability while in enhancing hop utilization brewers in over 46 states trust old orchard flavored craft juice concentrate blends pro brew as rotary can fillers in stock with a two to four week lead time omega's thylized yeasts bring intense guava and passion fruit aromas out of your malden hops don't miss the california craft beer summit march 12th through 14th in sacramento join the american homebrewers association to unlock the 2023 national homebrew competition medal winning recipes and Lotus Beverage Alliance introduces financial tools tailored exclusively for the needs of brewers and other beverage makers. If you've enjoyed this episode and you are not yet a subscriber to Craft Beer and Brewing, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, give yourself a gift this holiday. Uh, and if you are in the business of beer, consider an industry all access subscription along with that. Um, Chris, if people want to learn more about Green Bench, where do they find you? Yeah, you can head to our website, greenbenchbrewing.com. You can look at us on Instagram and uh, Facebook and all the uh, all the social media places. Uh, at Green Bench Brewing is um, our social media handle. You'll find us on all that stuff. Um, and you can find us here in St. Petersburg. It's a wonderful time to come. Honestly, our weather is probably better than anyone else right now because it's cold everywhere else and it's nice and pretty and sunny and you know nearly 80 degrees. So um, yeah, St. Petersburg, Florida, right downtown. Fantastic. One more thing before we go. Um, earlier this year, we launched a sister brand to Craft Beer and Brewing called Craft Spirits and Distilling. If you are a brewer out there who's listening to this podcast who also distills, drop me a line, J Jay Bogner at beerandbrewing.com. I'd love to hear from you. We're looking for folks to work with within this world and uh, you know who are familiar with us uh, to talk about how they distill and uh, would love to learn more about your businesses. So yeah, shoot me an email connect would love to and if uh, if it's something you are thinking about getting into as a bre uh, brewer and a lot of brewers are uh, we're definitely seeing that um, check out spirits and distilling.com uh, for more information on that chris thank you for giving me an excuse to come over here to st pete and uh, hang out with you and talk it is always my pleasure to do so always great to have you man it's good to see you thanks for having me on the podcast and uh, congratulations on another year and 10 years man congratulations on your 10 too cheers cheers This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those who love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.